Well, as you know, the lead story for, for well, for certainly the last four or five days has been Auckland, uh, the natural disaster that occurred to it on Friday night, Saturday morning. Um, the consequences of that, uh, the political fallout, the damage, the destruction. Um, almost 100 houses are now red stickered, so the, those lives will be destroyed. There's hundreds more that have been yellow stickered. There are cars that have been lost. There are possessions that have been lost to people who couldn't afford to lose them and can't afford to replace them. Uh, many are uninsured, particularly if they were poorer, because there is a cost of living crisis. And guess what? You try and deal with stuff you can, and you're trying to put food on the table and all those sorts of things first. Um, so, you know, it is a tough, grim time. And it ain't over yet. Still a red warning. Uh, upon the Coromandel and the Bay of Plenty today as we see this river of moisture um, cascade over us all. And even down here in the deepest south where we're experiencing 30 degree temperatures for the next four days um, and there is a mugginess in the air as a consequence that nobody can suggest that um, anything that we experience could be possibly any worse than what has been imposed upon Auckland. Um, in the wake of that, and certainly um, because, and I, you know, I've, I've opined on this a lot, so, you know, we'll let somebody else opine on this for a moment. There have been views that the Auckland City Council have simply been manifestly de um, derelict in their responsibilities uh, and have not discharged them. Um, and that has centred laser like um, upon the Mayor of Auckland, Wayne Brown. Um, one of the first people to be out there saying uh, his response is such that he should resign is David Latelli. Uh, you might know him better um, when he was the brown butterbean. I'll tell you what, he looks nothing like that now. Welcome to the show, David Latelli. You don't look like that now, David. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, been a, it's been a long journey, but yeah, 100 kilos down. Managed to keep most of it off, so... Um, you know, it's been good. Well, actually, I remember you when you were a boxer. Um, we, well, you were named after the original Butterbean, wasn't it? Who was a um, huge man who would get in the yeah. ring in the US um, and make a mockery sometimes of professional fighters and their reputations. You're a bit more skilled than that, I thought. Yeah, you know, it started off as a, as a circus act, you know, and, you know, really, look, I'd lost everything. And, you know, I was rebuilding my life and, you know, managed to use boxing as a, as a platform, but it was hard because everyone hated my guts. <laughs> I played this character like a wrestling heel, you know, of a bad guy, um, you, know, you know, who could talk it up and act the fool before Joseph Parker fights. But in, in the end, I ended up, you know, becoming not too bad at boxing. No, you were, and you, you won a number of international events. You had a 16-4, I think, uh, boxing record, yeah. which is not bloody yeah. bad, and you appear to have, I say only appear to have, most of your neurons still intact. Um, good on you. Now, you are also, though, and have been a community worker, so you've, um, and are regarded as something of an inspirational uh, local leader uh, in your community, um, but... Uh, you also, I think, supported Aficio Collins, I think, for the mayoralty at the last election as well. So that's why I'm asking you, on Saturday morning, you came out and said right away, I think you were the first person to say it, so, Mayor Brown has to resign because of his reaction to what transpired on Friday night, Saturday morning in Auckland. What, why, why? I mean, it's a simple answer, question. Look, I, it's just out of frustration. I spoke to Wayne, actually, and, he, you know, we'd spoken uh, before I, I talked about that. Um, and I told him to his face, this is the, 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 it's just been far too slow and it's too late. Why have you set up an evacuation centre out in Randwick Park where there's absolutely no need for this? You've got 120 empty beds out there, all this resource tied up, and you've got nothing here in Mangere, which is really, in terms of South Auckland, was the epicentre of this disaster for us. Um, you know, and so he started blaming his advisors, and I said, well, if that's your advisor, you need to fire them all. You know, but, um, you know and, and really, like, when he messaged me saying, why did you ask me to resign? I said, well, Wayne, you've done the same thing in your campaign out of frustration, you know, so this is what I've said. Uh, and the, the, the response uh, from all of them, and look, as I'm being on the ground in the, these past few days, just observing and working, and, you know, we're one of the only groups that services Auckland-wide, um, the council is just an absolute mess. Uh, it's no one's working as a team. They're all operating in silos. Um, 
a lot of them don't like uh, their leader, uh, and there, there's been really no leadership that they can follow anyway. But it's you know, so we're we're now every day we're taking stuff, uh, you know, two three times a day, taking supplies to this the official evacuation centre in Mangere Town Centre, right? Yeah. We're using all of our own money, all of our own uh, people that are donated. Uh, there's no not no government funding for the, what we're doing, this response, yet. But why, I um, keep asking, why is the council not bringing water there? Why, have we, why is it up to us to take six pallets of water? Of course we're going to do it, but they still haven't caught up with it. Okay. This is the frustration. I, I, you know I, mean? I, listen, I, I have every sympathy with your frustration. I understand that. Um, but isn't what Wayne Brown said in leading up to getting elected as mayor that he said this is exactly the organisation you've just described and hasn't he inherited that same organisation? All of the people there, same people, um, and is it any wonder that three months into the job, um, when he asks them what's going on, they get it wrong? Yeah, look, I think as, as a leader and as a leader myself, you have to stand up and you have to deliver right away. And this was his opportunity to do so. You know, and, and like what we said, when we turned up here on Saturday morning, we had, no, we had no supplies. But I had to stand up and make it happen. You know, and we did it straight away. And I was in conversations with Alf Filipina uh, on, from Friday night onwards to try and keep pushing, pushing, pushing. And, and, and for me, it's, it's, it comes down to, to the leader. Mm, it does. In this particular case, though, I understand what you're saying. There are two things, though, I'll just put to you, Dave. You tell me if I'm mm. right or if I'm wrong. There's the mayor's job of going out there and being the public face during a time mm. of crisis. But it's the chief executive's job who employs all the staff to make sure it's happening, isn't mm. it? Yeah, look, I don't know the inner workings of the way that these are. All, what I do know is that the system that he's working within is filled with a, a massive bureaucracy that's just yep. total rubbish. So yep. maybe he's caught up in that as well. You know, I, I do still talk to Wayne, and um, I've, I've said, look, um, you know, to multiple people, I'm happy to work with him uh, to, to help to give him what's actually going on on the ground. You know, to, and the thing is that what we're seeing, everyone out there's there's no, um, you know, all these councillors, they're working, it's a lot of the times they're working against each other. Of course they are. And, uh, mm. you know, he's got to get them, not send emails out. You've got to do this face-to-face. -face. Get them all into a room and, lay, and, and say, this is what's happening. Follow suit. Mm. Um, all you know, right. Now, I, I understand that. In the response, mm. though, to this, um, how much of this, Morris Williamson said this on the other side of the story, saying, um, listen, this is all still part of the grief, basically, um, reaction to Wayne Brown getting elected in the first place. Is there some truth to that? Yeah, look, you know, I, I actually wasn't going for a Thistle, uh in the, the mayor race. I was going, I was voting for Leo Brown. Oh, yeah. Leo Brown. Leo Malloy, yeah. you know, Team Leo, you yeah. know, who, who supported us for a long time and then got introduced to Wayne and uh, had him on my radio show and, and was in communications from then. So, okay. you know, I wasn't... Um, bias in that way you know it's just out, everything i say really comes from a, you know from the heart and just from the community level of what we're seeing you know and, and it comes out of frustration and and that's not just not just local this is you know central government as well it's everything's far too slow as i said to the prime minister yesterday we need to cut through all this bureaucracy and it just and just action it's all we want to see action and what did chris Hipkin say to you in response yesterday no, he agreed, and I, he agreed, and but you know, he, we, I take everything with a grain of salt from politicians. He agreed, and he wanted to meet when the source set was down. But I said to him, "Look, we need to think now." And I spoke to uh, Kieran uh, McNulty. I said, "Look, we need to be thinking about the the cleanup, and then when people go back into homes, what do ki these kids need to go back to school next week? Mm, mm. You know, that's what we need to be thinking of. Not just this emergency. We need to be thinking, uh, you know, two, three phases ahead." Even in terms of this cleanup, right? It's still they, they can't even get bins. Mm. So, like, we had a meeting today, and they're, they're, hold off, we got a, there's all this bureaucracy going on, and people working, not, not no communication, no leadership, uh, and they've told us no, no, we've just got to hold off and wait. The cleanup should be one underway already. You know, you know, this is in Mangere I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, there's some 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 places have bins in Mangere some don't. Councils, the councils can't. They can't work together to get things done. Uh, and that, that's the, the frustration uh, 
for me, you know, because for me, if I had the, the kind of resource they would, I'd have a bins everywhere that's needed in every street. <laughs> no, know, no, listen, you, you're, you're, you're not wrong. I mean, yeah. you would. Um, it's a big city. It's 1.7 million people. Mm. I'm interested in your perception, because you were in South Auckland when it happened, Friday night, Saturday yep, morning. So, but we, we, we're, we're also in, you know, I live out west, and we also, you know, we, we're out in Helensville, so we, we're everywhere, North Shore today, um, well, and I live at, my, my, my house was affected by the floods as well. Okay, I mean, the, the convenient thing about Auckland from an outsider's perspective is there's actually a city centre, there's literally a north, there's literally a west, there's literally a south, and there's literally an east. Um, so it's a really easy place to sort of get your handle around. Which was the worst of affected on Friday night, Saturday morning? The north, west, south or east? Jeez, um, I think definitely uh, south, west and central. South, west you know, and we, central, we run a, yep. yeah. Yeah, we run an organisation called, my family run an organisation called <laughs> Grace Foundation, which has women's refuges, you know, uh, uh, and community housing. One of these, the refuge, women's refuge in Parnell, is still, un, is still now trying to drain it. You know that was completely underwater. So it's mm. central, west, and and south were very badly hit. So what I'm hearing from that is that it was quite an. Uh, the storm was uh, an equal opportunity storm. It didn't just target lower socioeconomic groups. It targeted everybody. Hundred percent. Yeah. Um, all right, but, but the, yeah, the areas that are targeted in terms of south and west, it's um, you know a lot of these families are like like you said in the lead up, you know they're already uh, you know this has compounded the issue of poverty. It's made it even worse. Yeah, and that's the next bit for me because yeah. at the t at you've got a natural disaster that's just occurred. A lot of I've just talked mm -hmm. about insurance. I know a lot of those people won't be insured. Mm -hmm. um, no, no. They've, they've lost their car. They've lost their possessions. Um, uh, I mean, the the, the the deprivation index is just going to go off the scale in the next six oh, yeah. to 12 months. Can I ask yeah. you another question, though? Uh, and that is, um, in the South Auckland area, um, what needs to happen now? You've talked about bins at the end of streets to get rid of the rubbish and everything like that. What else needs to happen in those communities now that the council could be doing now, Dave? Yeah, well, we need to start the clean up and then looking at actually who, the emergency accommodation. Yeah. You know, they, they, a lot of these people uh, still don't have anywhere to stay. They're staying with families. Some of these houses we're delivering to have 30 people in them. Mm. So that's creating more issues. Uh, and, and then we need to look at when these, when these houses are ready to move back in again, where are they going to get their furniture? Mm. Where are they going to get their washing machines? All this mm. type of place. Mm. And, uh, and helping them to navigate, you know, that winds do have payments, helping people to navigate that because... Of, trying to navigate that space is a, is a, is a nightmare. Mm. Um, so that's why we're actually setting up a, another distribution centre uh, to store uh, donations and, and companies that are like Fisher & Paykel Appliances to get appliances, washing machines, all couches, all beds and all this stuff to just store it where families, when they need it, they, you know, with no bureaucracy, they can come and get it when they're ready to move back. And Dulux, Dulux Paint offered all their, you know, paint and painters that, just to help. So really that's the... Step. And then, then you also need counsellors. There's going to be a lot of grief coming out of this, a lot of mental health problems, a lot of domestic, uh, domestic violence issues because of the stress of this all. You know, that's all, that's all going to start coming out. Yes, I don't doubt you at all. Um, and finally, um, I'm interested in whether or not you believe. You see, in some ways this, this, this might... You see, I'm, I'm looking, trying to be a bit Pollyanna-ish about this. Sometimes when you've really r stuffed up, and you've stuffed up early in your term. I mean, Wayne Brown's got two years and three quarters, two and three quarter years to turn this around. Does mm. this in some ways though, do you think give him greater power at council for the reforms that he wants to enact? Yeah, look, I think his opportunity, um, I don't think he's gonna resign. I think he's got a no, really no, good no. opportunity here. Yeah. He's got a really good opportunity to, to come back from this and, and, and do really well. You know, so it, it's really up to him how, how he manages that. Uh, but he has got a really, uh, really good opportunity here to, to, to come back from it, you know. And, and like you said, he's got plenty of time. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Enjoyed talking to you, Dave. You also, you, I think your mum put out a book, didn't she? If I got that right? Oh, no, that, no, no. So, you know, I bought out a, I bought out a book and it's, uh, my mum's a part of it. That's right. She, I wanted to interview yeah. her over there. I will.
I'll still bring you back, if you don't mind, to talk specifically about the book. I thought your okay. mum's chapter was yeah. stunning. It's powerful. Yeah, it is. All right, look out yourself. Thank okay. you very much. Nice Thanks talk to much, you. Bro. Okay, bye bye. Um, that's David Latelli, the brown butterbean they called him. Now he's a community and social worker. He does an awful lot. Um, also at risk youth. Um, yeah, I know, boxing and stuff like that. But hey, um, and I think you'd probably say that um, he's probably walking back. I mean, uh, his, his, his initial reaction was frustration. Nobody's interviewed him since then. So, you know, he said the initial stuff back on Saturday. You could understand the frustration perhaps. Um, but, you know, today's Thursday. You've got the opportunity to think about things. Um, your thoughts, 0800 33 2283. Um, and Mayor Brown, is he being, is this now really, forget, no, don't forget the Dave Latellis because they're on the ground, they do good work. But is this, put that to one side, I should put it, and their views and how they're going to be doing things because there's obviously an awful lot to do. Auckland is going to be, ah, oh, poor old Auckland. You've had three years of COVID, you got shut down the second time, uh, and now you've got this. Seriously, <laughs> seriously. I don't know that Minister for Auckland's going to cut it. It's quarter to 11. Plunkett Unchained. His latest, greatest offering, Charlie McCoy. Charlie, how are you, mate? Happy New Year. Good morning, and to you too. Plunkett Unchained on the platform. You've been busy. Delving into the world of woke journalism again. <laughs> Can you tell us what web of coincidence is all about? Day after the last time we spoke, that was Halloween last year, 1 November. That was when it aired, the documentary Web of Chaos. And it coincided with a whole bunch of other stuff, similarly things that was going on at the same time, like the Justice Minister spoke about how hate speech reform is back on the card. That hooey was going on at the same time. The SIS was- one where they taught kids how to dob in their hair plaiting parents. And then a couple of days after that, the Human Rights Commissioner said that he's going to engage with the Prime Minister on how to step up the fight. So that's what the coincidences are. The most basic thing that I kind of missed in watching Web of Chaos, that you point out in Web of Coincidence, is that they had all these experts who were basically from the same organisation. They invented an area to be expert in, and then, then so when it comes up in the news, the journalist people need someone to go to. They've only got these people to go to. Plunkett Unchained, 7 to 10 weekday mornings on the platform. Um, all right, now, yesterday, going on from that story, uh, a couple of, um, well, quite a few, actually. Um, um, good morning, Michael. I see the mainstream media still harping on about being called drongos. Um, they weren't outraged when I were doing called Seymour a prick, were they? No, they weren't. Um, and, uh, in fact, I remember stories that the mainstream media ran saying, good on, Jacinda, you know? Um, but also, I have to say, and I'm going to say this, and I've said it forever. So you've got to remember that I go back to being um, a speechwriter and a press secretary for both Winston Peters uh, back in the late 1980s uh, when he was the preferred Prime Minister of New Zealand uh, and also Jim Bolger when he was leader of the opposition. And then obviously I've been involved in public relations and communications probably ever since in an official or a commercial perspective. But one of the things I've noticed about journalists, and I will say it again, and it is becoming more apparent with every day, is two things. The first thing about journalists is that they believe their own bullshit. Okay, so that's the first thing about journalists. Politicians don't believe their own bullshit. Politicians know they're bullshitting you. Politicians are completely aware it's bullshit and you listening to it at the other end, you know it's bullshit as well. So there's sort of a bullshit river that we both understand that we're swimming in when a politician talks to the media, uh, sorry, to the the public and the public talk back, all right? So politicians, as a general rule, don't believe their own bullshit. They put out a line and they know what that line is, but secretly they'll say to each other, God, yeah, but God... uh, and they'll always say, but, in private. So they'll put out something and they'll say, yeah, but, in private. Um, journalists are not like that. Journalists believe their own bullshit. And the bullshit that they primarily believe is that they are 
somehow the democratic policemen or women. They are the controllers of society. They call themselves the fourth estate, all right? So they call themselves the fourth estate because what they say is that they are a critical factor in democracy. Now, just think about this for a moment. I go to school, I'm someone like me, so I am a bit of a nerd who feels quite self-important. I'm an arrogant twat, basically, okay? Um, I go to university, I do an arts degree. I can't do science and maths, wrong side of the brain. I do things like sociology, psychology. I might do history. I might do English, except English is bloody difficult and I've got to do too much reading. And history is quite difficult too. I've got to write lots of essays. Now, I'll go the sociology, anthropology, psychology. Yeah, I'll go down that route. I then do my journalism studies, whether it's going to a polytechnic, uh, which means I don't get a, any university degree at all, so I don't have any in-depth knowledge of any subject at all. I've just gone to a polytechnic to do my journalism d- diploma, or I have go to a postgraduate course um, after I've done my rope BA. All right? Off I go. Uh, I do a year, and I'm out there. And now I'm a policeman. Now I'm sitting there as that's information that I choose to convey to you or not. And in the old days, the idea of the journalist was I'm observing something, I'm doing a bit of research on it, I'm writing what happened and I'm conveying that narrative to you. So these are the facts, here they are. About uh, probably late 80s, early 90s, Journalists started to have opinions that they put into their narrative, all right? So they would give you the facts, and then at the end of it, they'd usually give them their opinion of what this means. That's when the rot set in. Now, remember, we're talking about kids that have come straight, gone from school, gone to university, and now telling you what they think. Oh, bugger off. Don't have a mortgage. Probably don't even own a car. Got a debt with a bank. Um sense of incredible self-importance and the ego to match. Uh, Can't write uh, because if they could write, they wouldn't be a journalist. And then they decide that they're going to put their opinion into their story. And eventually what's occurred is that the narrative has got overtaken by the opinion. Now, I don't think you'd read a news story without the opinion or the narrative of the particular writer or broadcaster being right up there to front with. They're not a talkback host. I'm an opinion guy. I give you opinions. You tell me your opinions. We share those opinions together. I'm not a journalist. But what's the difference between me and a journalist at the moment? Nothing. Except I've probably got a better recall of facts and a damn sight more uh, general and human knowledge. Apart from that. Um, But there you go. So that's the first thing. They believe that they are the arbiters of the truth and that they are also policemen for society. They tell you who's doing right or wrong. That's the next part of a journalist, sort of 1A if you like. They see the world in black and white. Yeah. They have to see the world in black and white because they're conveying an opinion, a narrative. And they've got to convey it in two or three hundred words or 15 seconds of television time, usually 30 seconds, or maybe a minute of a news item in radio. So they shorthand everything really quickly and they make sure also that their opinion's in there somewhere. So the way in which they present the news is never complex. It's never nuanced. It's always there's black, there's white. Good example, Radio New Zealand, where all the best journalists are meant to go and stuff where all those experienced journalists are meant to go, they've decided Wayne Brown is the villain. So he, there's no nuance there. He is the villain, all right? He's the baddie. Jacinda Ardern, she was the goodie. And so they never brought the same kind of examination upon Jacinda Ardern in five years of being Prime Minister that they've done in two weeks for Wayne Brown, a newly elected 
Mayor of Auckland encountering a crisis and with a staff who I would suggest to you are effing hopeless. All right, particularly his senior staff and management. I mean, that's why they're there. Local government's known, known to attract morons. And usually it works on the Peter principle. You know that. Don't need to explain it to you. All right. So the second part of the journalists have a problem with is knowing that I am the repository of truth and knowing that I make an opinion, I can't stand criticism. And so journalists are incredibly personally thin-skinned. It's the difference between a politician and a journalist. Politicians are used to getting beaten about. I mean, we've been beaten before, but twos, even before we thought about entering any public life. We're used to people having a go at us on social media and media all the time and telling us that we're, you know, twat number one, twat number two, and your raw twatness. We're used to that. It, it, I won't say that it rubs off, runs off uh, us like a, you know, water off a duck's back, but at the end of the day, you develop a pretty thick skin. Journalists don't. It's so thin that even if you touch them, they bruise. Even if you look at them, they bleed. Um, and so you put together a fine sense of self-importance, number one. Two, you put together the next part of that with that fine sense of self-importance, a belief that you are society's policeman. And then three, a sensitivity that really you should be in psychological counselling from, but is part of the profession anyhow, and then you ask us to take you seriously. Is it any reason, and I ask this of the mainstream media, that in actual fact politicians who lie for a living and um, always give a good bullshit narrative, and we know we do, um, is it any surprise that in actual fact, despite being so earnest, so informed, so educated, and so opinionated, your public trust rating is right down there with the politicians and the pedophiles and the neocosmicos. Hmm? Yeah. There you go. Um, journalists used to pass an ethical bar similar to a barista. I don't think they've ever had an ethical bar, have they? And that's the other thing. Oh boy, you've raised a good question there. Journalists also believe, and there are certain types of journalists who believe, that they're after the scoop. They want the sensational story, so they'll always, and they're taught to write their first sentence as a sensational story. But can I also say, just quickly, they are prepared to stoop to conquer on a daily basis. Um, and they are prepared to lie, to pretend to be people's friends, to steal, to deal in stolen property. Um, they are to get a story. Their argument is our sources. Mm. But you're quite prepared to engage in illegal, illicit and immoral behaviour to get it. For the rest of us, if we did that, the first people to tell us we indulged in illegal, illicit or immoral behaviour would be the journalists. But it doesn't stop them on a daily basis doing the same. Um, what's the Peter Principle, Pope? And I'm Peter. Uh, the Peter Principle, that you are promoted in local government always one step beyond your level of competence. That's the Peter Principle. All right? So it works in all bureaucracies. So I think central government works that bureaucracy. Central government bureaucracy is slightly brighter. But um, it doesn't matter. The Peter Principle works on you're always promoted one step above your ability, which means why you cock it up. If you listen to David Latelli's interview just now, he was expressing a frustration, but I was listening to that as a mayor or as a former mayor, knowing, and as a former mayor who would be new to an organisation. When Wayne Brown got elected three months ago, he inherited the chief executive of the Auckland City Council, all of the senior managers, all of the middle managers and all of the staff. Dave Brown only employs, sorry, Wayne Brown only employs one person. Do you know who that person is? The chief executive. If Wayne Brown wanted to get rid of, pardon me, of the chief executive of the Auckland City Council, can he do that? No. No. That would have to be the collective decision of all 20-odd councillors. All right? 
So what power really does Wayne Brown have with the bureaucracy? If the bureaucracy have gone home because it's Auckland anniversary weekend, oh, like Waka Kota, he did, a government department, um, responsible only for the roads that are getting flooded and the slips that are going to be happening and the trees that are falling all over, um, all of the transport network of Auckland. If Waka Kotahi go home on Friday afternoon, what do you think the senior managers were doing at the Auckland City Council? Dave Latelli was frustrated. You can hear it. I understand that. He's calmed down a bit. He's still frustrated, though. He's waiting for stop talking to me and start doing action to happen. And he hasn't seen it yet because he knows that he's dealing with people in the midst, literally, of a crisis. They may not be drowning, not anymore, but can I tell you, they woke up this morning and everything that Dave Latelli said is true. I've got no money, I've got no house, I've got no car, and I've got no insurance, and I've got no prospect of any future looking after me and my kids. What am I going to do? There would be hundreds, if not, yeah, no, there would be hundreds, very possibly thousands of Aucklanders in that state as I talk to you now.